Hi there. I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back for more conversations. Scott Anderson is with us. He is the prolific author of four books, including two novels. His latest, a riveting book entitled The Quiet Americans, is about four men who were spies for America during the Cold War. Frank Wisner, a patrician lawyer turned spymaster. Peter Seychelle, a German Jew who escaped the Nazis. Michael Burke, a swashbuckling football star. And Edward Lansdale, an ad man who became a legendary spy network in the Philippines. Why did they do it and what did they accomplish? Our guest will tell us. We're pleased to welcome Scott Anderson to the program. Thank you, Jim. My pleasure to be here. Now, congratulations on your book, The Quiet Americans. Is this a riff on uh, Graham Greene's novel? <laughs> it the is. The Quiet American? Uh, it, it is. It's, it's, uh, it's a bit of a take on that. Um, it, it seems to be a pattern with my, my previous book was called Lawrence in Arabia, taken from Lawrence of Arabia. So it seems to be a, <laughs> a pattern of mine to crib uh, other book titles. It's like an O. Henry twist. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> now, your, your subtitle is A Tragedy in Three Acts. What was the tragedy and why three acts? Well, I think the tragedy was that I, 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 so this book very much is focused on the early part of the Cold War, from the end of World War II in 1945 up to the Hungarian Revolution in 1956. And I really feel, felt through doing research and, th and through the stories of the men I'm, I'm writing about that there was kind of a golden opportunity with the Hungarian Revolution in 56 that the, the, uh, the Cold War could have been ended at that point. And instead, because of what happened in the Hungarian Revolution, Khrushchev had just come to power, but the Americans were still very much in, in kind of the Red Scare uh, uh, moment in, of American politics. Uh, this, op this chance for a, an opening uh, passed, and, uh, and it remained passed for the next 33 years until Gorbachev came along. So that's, that's kind of why uh, the, the, the ultimately I see it as a tragedy. The, the three acts is, is really, the, the first act is, is coming out of World War II. The Americans, I feel, were very slow to recognize the threat from the Soviets. Um, uh, Truman had this idea that we could, we could maintain the wartime alliance with the Soviet Union when Stalin was already grabbing up Eastern Europe and, and planning to, uh, greater acquisitions in Iran. Uh, Korea was, was shortly to come. Um, and, and then the, f the, the fallout of that in, in the, the period of the, of the Red Scare in this country that, was re that uh, to my mind, was, was very misdirected and destroyed a lot of lives and prolonged the, the, the Cold War. Now, the granddaddy of all this uh, was the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, which was uh, the ancestor of the CIA, That's functioned right. during World War II. All four of the people you uh, write about were in the OSS and then morphed into the, the CIA during the Cold War. Uh, but uh, how did uh, the OSS compare with the, the CIA as it uh, began to evolve? I, I think the, the great mistake that Americans made was thinking, what, the OSS, as you said, was, was during the wartime, um, uh, during World War II. CIA c came along in 1947, there were a couple of uh, temporary organizations that linked the two. But I think that in the early Cold War, CIA thought that the tactics and strategies that worked in World War II with the OSS uh, could just be replicated. And, and in fact, you're in a very, very different type of conflict. So yes, all four of the, the men I write about all came out of the OSS. Um, at the end of World War II, in, in the summer of 1945, uh, two stayed on in intelligence uh, capacities for the American government. Two went back to their civilian lives. Uh, over the next two years, the, the Cold War really set in. It looked like Greece was going to uh, fall to the communists. Um, the CIA was created in 1947. Finally, Truman recognized that the Soviets were not going to be a, a post-war ally, that they were going to be, in fact, an adversary. So he started the CIA. The other two men who had left the OSS um, both had w wives and young children, um, and I think they missed the game. And so when they were, when they were approached to join the CIA, both instantly uh, <laughs> had joined up. Um, so, and in fact, one of the men, Peter Sichel, that you mentioned, uh, is still alive. He is turning 100 next week. Uh, he, he was an amazing, amazing uh, man. He was a, a wine merchant, wasn't he? A wine merchant, that's right. He, he, after he left the CIA in 1960, his family had been uh, uh, wine merchants in Germany. 
uh, prior to World War II. He inherited the family um, uh, wine, wine company. And that uh, was actually responsible for uh, Blue Nun, if you remember that wine from the 1960s and 70s. <laughs> that was Peter's handiwork in, in the U.S. So. Well, I probably drank so much of it that I don't remember. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> now, did these four men know one another? Most of them did. The one exception to that was, uh, was Lansdale, um, who was... So Frank Wisner, during the war, knew both Michael Burke, uh, the, the, the football star, and Peter Sitchell. They, they had all been in, in Europe. Ed Lansdale had what they called a bad war uh, in World War II. He, he, never, he never left the States. Um, he was older, um, and he had a medical condition, so he was never, uh, never posted abroad during the war. He went out to the Philippines immediately after the end of World War II, and so he, he was very much in the Asian theater of the, the anti-communist effort. Uh, so he was, he was the exception. The other three all knew each other. They all worked in Europe, in, in, both in World War II and in, in the early Cold War. Uh, now, uh, John Foster Dulles, our uh, uh, hawkish Secretary of State, uh, recognized that uh, something that was kind of counter to uh, American foreign policy, or eventually came to recognize it, that uh, it really wasn't all uh, about uh, Soviet uh, expansion and uh, right. uh, domination of, uh, of world politics. Uh, it was something else. You want to talk about that a little and how it affected uh, the, the spy agencies? Yeah, absolutely. I, to my mind, John Foster Dulles was one of the <laughs> was one of the great villains of the of the twentieth century, and really kind of hastened the end of, of the American century. Dulles saw everything in, in very black and white terms when he became Eisenhower's Secretary of State. And, and, and you know, you're talking about the, the early 1950s, at a time when, when independence moves, movements were spreading all throughout the Third World in, in the former colonial possessions. And Dulles saw virtually all of these as, as communist fronts um, and actively fought against them. Uh, the other thing he did was it was uh, parliamentary governments in Guatemala and Iran uh, that were non-aligned and, and trying to pursue a, a kind of a non-alignment between the United States and the Soviet Union, he saw those as communist fronts. So in Guatemala and uh, Iran uh, in 1953, 1954, the uh, democratic governments were overthrown by the CIA. Belatedly, as he was, as in fact, as he was dying from cancer, Dulles recognized or acknowledged that in fact, a lot of these these uh, independence movements, the, the anti-colonialist movements, were not inherently pro-communist. They just wanted independence and autonomy from. They wanted to stay out of the of the the, the, the superpower great game. Um, but but by that time, a lot an awful lot of damage had been done. Um, and adding to the disillusionment of, of at least two of the men that I I write about, and, and they all both these men left the CIA during that time. Uh, one of the uh, principal spy masters, uh, indeed, perhaps the principal spy master you write about, was uh, Frank Wisner. Right. Uh, very interesting, fascinating character. A Wall Street lawyer, patrician background, almost uh, Wild Bill Donovan's model. That's right. Of uh, of a spy, uh, Donovan was the founder of the OSS during the war, in which Wisner participated. Could you talk a little bit about Frank Wisner and what his yeah was? yeah Frank Wisner is a, a fascinating figure as he said he was very patrician a Wall Street lawyer from a very uh, very wealthy family from Mississippi uh, Central Mississippi uh, went to UVA law school top of his class hired by a white shoe firm in Wall Street. Um, same firm that Franklin Roosevelt was. That's right. Of. That's right. And quit in 1940 before the Americans came into the war. Since the, the war was, the America was going to have to join the war. Uh, quit, joined the Navy, and eventually became, was transferred over to the OSS during the war. Um, the, the amazing thing with Wisner, he happened to be, he was probably the first American serviceman to see what happened when the Soviet Red Army marched into a country. He, hap he arrived in Bucharest, Romania in the summer of 1944, right when the, the Soviet Red Army was sweeping west uh, against the Nazis. And he saw how um, basically the, 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 the Soviets were just taking over Romania in, in 
in lockstep and very, very fast. And he was sending cables back to the OSS headquarters in, in Washington saying, look, I know there are allies, but this is what they're doing, and they're going to do it elsewhere. Um, they didn't want, Washington didn't want to hear it because, of course, we're still allies. We have to defeat the Nazis. So everything else is secondary until that happens. So Wisner was one of the first people. To, he was kind of the canary in the coal mine as far as seeing what Stalin's designs were going to be in, in the post in the post war era. Um, he joins the he he goes back to his law firm at the end of the of, of the war. When the CIA starts up, uh, he's approached and asked if he wants to head the clandestine operations uh, wing of the CIA. Uh, it's called the Office of Policy Coordination, and it, the name deliberately chosen to be in, incredibly boring, <laughs> um, so no one would know what they were really up to. And the name itself, the Office of Policy Coordination, was a national secret uh, until, for 25 years. Um, so Wisner headed that. So Wisner was really the man sitting behind the desk in Washington, running all the clandestine operations of the CIA throughout their early Cold War. Um, his great dream was to provoke. A, a, a true anti-communist uprising um, in, in a Soviet-controlled country, especially in Eastern Europe. So the CIA had operations throughout the Soviet Union and in the, the Soviet bloc nations of Eastern Europe to drop anti-communist partisans behind the lines late, ni late 1940s through the 1950s. The, all the operations were disasters. The, the KGB had all these, these groups inf thoroughly infiltrated from the get-go. Th hundreds, if not thousands, of men lost their lives doing this, and the great tragedy in 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 Frank Wisner's life was that with the spontaneous anti-communist uprising in Hungary in 1956, finally, after 11 years of trying to provoke something and only meeting disaster, here's here's something that really happened. The CIA never saw coming, ironically enough. The the agency had no idea that, that Hungary was about to explode. Um, spontaneous combustion. Spontaneous combustion. And Wisner happened to be in Europe at the time. He's sending cables back to, to Eisenhower and John Foster Dulles saying, it's finally happened. We have to, we have to, you know, th this is what we've been working for all this time. We have to uh, support the Hungarian uh, freedom fighters. And and then the tanks rolled in. And then the, the tanks rolled in. And Eisenhower realized that, you know, if we actually, after all this lip service of, of you know, li liberation of, of, of captive nations, if we actually involve ourselves, it could provoke World War III. So they just stood back and let the, the Hungarian revolutionaries be crushed. And it crushed Fr Frank Wisner. In fact, he had a, he had a massive uh, nervous breakdown uh, at that time and ended up uh, which he never really recovered from. And from then on, he had psychiatric problems. He ended up committing suicide in, in uh, about nine years later, actually on the, on the very anniversary of, of the Hungarian Revolution. The, the, the day the tanks rolled in was the day he, he killed himself. So great tragedy. Yeah. Uh, now, what did these four men uh, have in common, if anything? You know, th that's a great question. And I think what, the, ultimately the appeal, the, uh, of course, patriotism, and, and, and then the notion of that time that I think one thing they shared was this idea that we, we've defeated one enemy, the Nazism, fascism, but here comes another one that's coming that's, that it set out to, like fascism, to enslave uh, the world. I mean, that was their world view. Um, I think also just a love of adventure. These men had been plucked from their, from their normal lives. They had had crazy adventures in World War II. Michael Burke had been airdropped behind Nazi lines in, in France and, and joined the partisans in, in, in battles in the, in the French countryside. Um, and then to kind of be dropped back into, into your stateside existence and uh, I think was very hard for them to adjust to. I think the other thing that was, had a great appeal in the early CIA was they were kind of making things up as they went along. So there was, guys in the field had a tremendous amount of latitude and freedom of action. It wasn't, it wasn't yet everything being controlled by you know, seven layers of, of authority above you. Guys were put in the field. Peter Sichel was the CIA station chief in, in Berlin and kind of just left to, he was, he was 22 years old when he was CIA station chief and just kind of expected to figure things out as he went along. So I, I think that was a huge part of the appeal.
uh, a sense of uh, patriotism and adventure and, uh, and also uh, responsibility and power. And power. Right, and and personal initiative, and and um, I mean, it must have been. I, of course, war is always <laughs> an awful thing. Except this was, by and large, was not a shooting war, the Cold War. Um, but I, I've talked to Peter Sichel about it, and and, and he, at one point he came back to the states in 1947, and he was thinking about taking over his family's wine business at that time. Um, he had been he had been away for the previous five years, both in World War II and then in the in the post war, and he arrived back in New York and and just said, you know what, I can't do this. I, it's it's like he, Berlin was the center of the universe in in 1947. So he he was here for about ten days and he he was he was taught, he had handed in his resignation from from the, the successor of the OSS and he tore up his resignation and went back to Berlin. So. Now, Ed Lonsdale uh, focused mainly in the Philippines. Philippines and Vietnam, and, yes. Well, first the Philippines. That's he right. had uh, great success there in uh, putting down a, uh, uh, a communist insurrection, didn't he? That's right. That's right. And the, um, the great irony of Lansdale is that, so he, he arrived, he first arrived in 1945, right at the end of World War II. He was, he was uh, in the Philippines off and on for the next... Uh, about six, seven years. And one reason, it, it, kind of going to my last point about the, the incredible freedom of, of action these men had, this communist insurgency had started up in the Philippines and he was sent with two aides uh, to try to help the Pil Filipino military figure out how to, to, you know, to combat this insurgency. And it, it was almost this, the, the minuscule size of this American mission to help the, the anti-communists in the Philippines was what made it successful. Um, after he, he was successful in the Philippines, uh, he, he really did help uh, kind of reform the Filipino military, uh, found a populist leader who, uh, the Filipino, uh, the political leadership of the Philippines had always been incredibly corrupt, run by oligarchies. I found a populist leader. Um, in Magsaysay. In Magsaysay, right. And then, he, so he, when he came back to Washington, uh, the Dulles brothers said, okay, we have another problem in Asia. We want you to go and just do the same thing you did in the Philippines. And that was Vietnam in 1954. So Lansdale went out and to, he was the head of the first American military mission uh, into South Vietnam in 1954. It consisted of him and 12 American soldiers. That was it. And again, in, over the next year, year and a half, probably because of the very, there was no bureaucracy involved, these men were allowed to feel their way and, and, and try things out that they thought would work, and, and, you know, and they're among the Vietnamese people, um, probably came closer to, to actually s saving, if, uh, uh, in scare quotes, uh, South Vietnam than the half million troops that were going to be there by 1968. It was the very size of the American involvement in Vietnam that ultimately, I think, that doomed it to failure. Uh, by the way, uh, Wisner functioned in the Philippines with Lansdale, did he not? A little bit. Yeah. He was. He was more. He would have been more in a, a supervisory role. He came out to the Philippines a couple of times, um, but he he wasn't really based in the Philippines as much. But he he made he made fact finding. Now, there. Lansdale uh, recognized that. Uh, uh, the United States policy in Vietnam was uh, doomed to failure. Right. Uh, and but he didn't resign in protest. Uh, That's he, right. He uh, went back to Washington. I think it. I think it goes to this uh, this issue of wanting to stay in the game. You know, it's it's a hard game to to leave, especially when you have the you, when you have the the, the freedom and, and the the authority that a man like like Lansdale had. The the the. Important thing that I, I think Lansdale really was a visionary in a lot of ways, and what he said in the Philippines and he said it again in Vietnam was, it's not enough to to, to be against something. It's not enough to be anti-communist. You, if you if you want to if you want to have these countries uh, um, be anti-communist, be pro-West, um, you have to give the people something to believe in. You have to give them a government that answers to them. And it, you know, and this. This sounds very obvious, but but for some reason it was quite revolutionary at the time, and so Lansdale became known as the, as the miracle worker of Asia. And really, all he did was push this idea of transport, trans, exporting the American dream 
and listening to the local people and listening to what they wanted, you know, whether it was agrarian reform or electrification or, you know, schools, medical clinics. That's really what it came down to. Well, that's what worked in the Philippines. That's what worked in the Philippines, yeah, and that's what he was trying to do in Vietnam. And, and uh, so you had a pattern that seemed to exist both under the OSS regime and, uh, and later on of uh, training spies and sending them into these uh, communist countries. Right. Uh, and uh, they probably were exposed at some point or uh, they just were ineffective and it, it really didn't work. And Lansdale recognized that. That's it, right. Isn't that right? That's right. And, and the, the, the thing with these anti-communist, these partisan groups that were operating all through Eastern Europe is the Americans were really babes in the woods when it came to to counterintelligence and, and um, the KGB had these groups wired from the get-go. So they, they probably knew the moment they were being airdropped in um, that, that they, they were on their way. And actually, uh, Peter Sichel, um, it, it's, it's kind of an amazing story of how he left the CIA. It was 1960. He was the CIA station chief in Hong Kong at that time. And the number two man in the CIA came out. They had, there was a meeting in, in Hong Kong of the, the regional CIA station chiefs. Um, and the number two man said, we're starting a new program against Mao's China. And we're going to, it's going to be $100 million, which is a lot, that was money back then. Um, we're going to be dropping anti-communist partisans into Mao's China and with the idea that you're going to foment a revolution. And Peter Sichel, during a break in this conference, took, the, t t took his, uh, uh, his supervisor aside and said, look, we'd save so much time and money if we just killed them ourselves. Um, this is doomed to failure. And then he just, and right there he said, I'm out, I'm done. I can't, I can't do this again. And, and, and this was also Michael Burke, um, his experience, he had been head of clandestine operations in Germany in, in the immediate, immediate post-war and it had been his main job to be dropping all these commandos behind the Iron Curtain and again saw hundreds of men just vanish. And that was ultimately the reason he left too. Uh, he, he just couldn't see this, 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 you know, this bloodbath happening. Anymore. So what uh, Seychelle meant by uh, we do just as well killing them ourselves, he meant killing our agents. Right, that's right, that's right. Killing all these people that we were going to be dropping in. Our assets. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and so that's the way it ended. Uh, now, what is it about the, the intelligence services, about the CIA? So many directors have uh, left either under a cloud or uh, uh, have lost the confidence of the president and were replaced. Uh, and certainly we saw in the, in the Trump administration uh, right. uh, certainly no respect or regard for the uh, intelligence services. What is there about spycraft that uh, gets uh, so many people in trouble. And as the church committee uh, right. investigation in 1975 showed. Uh, right. I, I, th I feel like the CIA throughout its history has, has oscillated between this very activist approach where you talk about the church committee in 1975 where, or the early CIA where they're doing commando operations in, in, or, or overthrowing governments in Iran and Guatemala. So there's, there's that whole activist side that, and you're going to get caught out eventually with, with, with that kind of stuff in a, in a free society with an open media. You're going to find out about Iran, you're going to find out about Guatemala, no matter how much you try to keep it quiet. So that's going to blow back on you. Um, I think in another way, there, there, is this, this, uh, there is this massive bureaucracy now that's built up around the CIA. And it's often, it, like in any bureaucracy, it's often very difficult to get a contrarian voice to move its way up the ladder to a position w to, that reaches the people that decide policy. People, in, and we saw this with Iran, uh, excuse me, with Iraq, of course, in 2003. People in the field were, were casting doubt on the whole issue of WMDs and Saddam Hussein. But what happened to those voices? Because the administration at the top is convinced or wants to be convinced that something exists, it's very difficult for those voices to reach, you know, to, to go on up. So you have, so I think you have the problem you have with the CIA, and maybe it's inherent to most spy agencies, is you have the, the sins of commission, the overthrows of democratic regimes, and you have the sins of omission, of, of, of things you just 
are blindsided by because of the way your organization is set up. It's not designed to detect the, these, these sorts of issues or to have the, the word climb the ladder. Okay, so I have a question for you, Scott yeah. Anderson, because we have to wrap up. <laughs> okay. And uh, my question is that we hear so much in terms of intelligence nowadays about SIGINT, uh, signal intelligence, about drones, right. which were handled by, were and are handled by the CIA. Uh, uh, we have uh, cyber, uh, and not so much about uh, the old-fashioned spycraft. So my question for you is, where are the quiet Americans today? <laughs> I, yeah, I, I, I think they're probably sitting, most of them are sitting in Langley looking at computer screens, they're unfortunately. In, they're, not, they're not out having great adventures. In so. Langley, Virginia, <laughs> in front of a screen. That's right. Oh, That's Scott right. Anderson has been marvelous. And uh, thank you so much My for pleasure, coming Jim. by. Thank, thank you. you for coming by. Tune in next week for more conversations. Meanwhile, visit our website, conversationswithjimzyron.com. Mean, and also, take care, be well, all the best. I'm Jim Zyron. Have a good day.